to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The Bible says, the wages of sin is death. Romans chapter 6, verse number 23. For all honest today, of those of us who are of an accountable age and mind, we've sinned. We've fallen short of the glory of God. How do we get right with Almighty God? And what does the Bible say about my sin, our sin, and God's forgiveness? We hope you've got your Bible. If you don't have it, please locate your Bible as we're going to look at this very important subject today from the Word of God to find out how to deal with sin and to learn about God's forgiveness. And so stay tuned as we think about this amazing subject. We're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. As always, we want you to know that today's lesson is being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your local area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. Whether that be on Sunday for worship or Wednesday for Bible study, you would be an honored guest at any of their assemblies. You'll find people there who love God, who love others, and who are deeply concerned about the souls of men and women. Friend, if you've got a Bible question, maybe you're wondering about salvation or the church or, or any number of religious uh, matters, you'll find people in the Lord's church in your local area who'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God with you in kindness and love and look at the truth of God's Word. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your desire to know God better. We encourage you to check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our lessons. They're available to you free of charge. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, just go to our website, fill out a media request form. We'd be happy to make that available to you as a digital download or other formats if you need that as well. And friend, we want to encourage you also to check us out on Facebook, like our Facebook page, follow us on that. Great way to keep up with things that we're doing. And then, of course, in our fast-paced world today, where everybody's got a smartphone, we want to encourage you to check out the Gospel of Christ app that's available in the respective play stores. You can get it there, and it's a great way to keep up with our new lessons, what we're doing, and just so that you can know how we're trying to spread the Gospel and reach people with the news of Jesus Christ. And as always... We want to thank you today for joining us for our study. Hope you've got your Bible ready. Let's look to the Word of God together. From the Garden of Eden right up to today, sin has plagued mankind. In Genesis chapter 3, when God told Adam and Eve not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they did it anyway, sin came into the world. Death came with that, and a need for a Savior came also. And friend, for those of us who are, are of an accountable age and accountable mind to know right and wrong and to understand the consequences, the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That sin that all of us are responsible and accountable for, the Bible teaches it has consequences. The soul who sins shall surely die. My sin and your sin, it, it, it separates us from God. The Lord's ear is not heavy that he cannot hear. His arms not shortened that he cannot save. But your sins and your iniquities have separated you from your God. And do you remember Ecclesiastes 7 verse 20? There's not a righteous man on the face of the earth who does good and does not sin. If we say we have no sin, we make him a liar and the truth is not in us. 
1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. Thankfully, although I've sinned and you've sinned, God has made a way of salvation so that we can be saved from that sin. Do you remember the words of 1 Peter 2, 24? The Bible says of Jesus, He Himself bore our sins in His own body upon the tree that, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf. Jesus Christ tasted death for every man, Hebrews 2.9, and thus He is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours alone, for the sins of the whole world. Friend, while, while we understand that all our sins are covered by the blood of Jesus when we obey the gospel, when a person submits to God's teaching and is immersed in water for the remission of his sins, Acts 2.38, Acts 22.16, we understand that the blood of Jesus covers our sin. But what about for someone who after they become a child of God, they sin, they make mistakes, and they continue to do things that are not right with God? Friend, thankfully, we have a forgiving God, we have a second law of pardon, and we have a way to get right with God even after we've obeyed the gospel. And that's what we want to think about today. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. From time to time, if we're honest, we all say and do things and act like sometimes we ought not to act like. How do we make that right? Friend, it's good to know that Christians serve a forgiving God. I want you to look at this verse with me in your Bible. Would you open to the book of Psalms chapter 86? It's so good today to know that the God we serve is a forgiving God. Scripture says, For you, Lord, are good, and notice this, and ready to forgive, and abundant in mercy to all who call upon you. Look at Psalm 85. Verse number two, you have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all their sins. Psalm 103, verses 10 through 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Friend, the good news, the hope, the thing that we can focus on today is that although from time to time we do make mistakes, we do not serve a God who's ready to punish and to send people. Don't get me wrong. Those who live in sin and die in sin don't make that right. Suffer the consequences of sin. That's not what God wants. God wants all men to be saved. 1 Timothy 2.4, He doesn't want anybody to perish. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. And so it's encouraging to know our God is ready to forgive sin. It encourages me to know that God wants to forget my sin and to put it in the past. Jeremiah 31, verse 34, the Bible says, I'll be merciful to their sins. Their lawless deeds I'll remember no more. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12 quotes that very verse and says, God says, I'll remember their sins no more. It's not that God doesn't know that it happened or doesn't know what happened, but God willfully chooses not to hold that against us because His Son died so that sin could be forgiven. Psalm 51, David said, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Put all my sins behind me. God says, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, I'll make them white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, I shall make them like wool. What do all those pictures and ideas portray? God washing sin, God covering sin, God forgetting about sin. Friend, all of that teaches us that God doesn't want to focus on the sin. God wants to forget that. When sin is dealt with and addressed in the way God tells us to, it's in the past. That's why Paul could say, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. If God forgives and forgets, friend, that's a very encouraging thing. 
You see, my friend, when I think about our God as a forgiving God, it reminds me of how long-suffering God is. You think about the long-suffering of God. Think about how he dwelt with, with Israel, with all their all their weaknesses and complaints and problems. Think about it for just a moment. God took Israel out of Egyptian bondage. Through the plagues, he miraculously showed his power, forced, as it were, Pharaoh to let them go. They're now free, and they're headed toward the promised land, and, and the, their belly begins to growl a little. And they say to Moses and God, what'd you do? Bring us out here to kill us? We need something to eat. Can you imagine how long-suffering God must have been to put up with all that? And then I'm reminded again of the words of 2 Peter 3, verse 9. The Lord's not slow concerning his promises as some count slowness. What is he then? He's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God doesn't want me to go to hell. God doesn't want you to go to hell. God has given ample time and ample opportunity because he is a long-suffering God who wants us to be saved. And my friend, that point, that idea of our God being ready to forgive is so dramatically illustrated in his plan to forgive people. While we were still without strength, the Bible says, in due time, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man, perhaps one dare die, for a good man, some might dare to die, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And yet that Word left heaven, came to this earth, dwelt among men, was laughed at, was mocked, was called the chief of the demons, was spit upon, was beaten, was hung on a cruel cross, and God allowed all that to happen because that's how ready, that's how much God wants to forgive us of our sins. Now, let's, let's kind of illustrate that idea. I want to think about with you for a few moments some examples in the Bible of God's forgiveness of his children who messed up. One of the prime examples in the Old Testament is that of David. King David, man after God's own heart, he fell into a temptation in 2 Samuel 11 and 12. David's lust of the flesh get him caught up in sin with Bathsheba. He commits sexual lust, uh, uh, adultery, fornication there. Whole litany of sins and problems occur because of that. And yet, even though David, who was a very public figure and messed up in a very public way, God still forgave him. Listen to Psalm 51 verses 1 and 2. Listen to what David says about God's forgiveness. And this is talking about that exact event. David says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Friend, God did that. Adam and Eve's another example. God told them not to eat of the tree in the, knowledge, in, the, in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They ate. There were physical consequences. They were cast out of the garden. They opened the door for sin and death. But even then, in that dark passage, in Genesis 3, verse 15, God began to bring a Savior. The seed of woman would crush the head of Satan. The plan of God entered into the world to take care of the sin problem. Let me give you a couple of examples in the New Testament. A good example that we can all relate to probably is that of Peter. Peter in one moment stands with Jesus and he says, Lord, I don't care if everybody else abandons you, I'll die with you. And Jesus says, Peter, I need to tell you something. 
Before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. Peter's out, out there in the courtyard, warming himself up by the fire. Hey, weren't you with him? Oh, no, not me. I don't even know that man. You, you, say, you look like him. You sound like him. Sure. And Peter began to curse and to call down oaths and to swear, I don't even know the man. And then he heard that sound of that rooster crow. What about Peter? Peter, do you love me? You know I love you, Lord. Do, do you love me? Sure I do. Feed me. Jesus restored Peter in John 21 and helped Peter to see that although he had failed, he could come back and he could do great things in the kingdom of God. One of the clearest examples of forgiveness is that of Simon the sorcerer. Acts chapter 8, Simon has taught the gospel. He is baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ by an inspired man of God. And almost immediately after seeing that they were had the ability to give miraculous gifts, Simon, who was a sorcerer, a con artist, Hey, you give me, I'll give you money if you give me that gift. Let me buy it from you. And Peter said, your heart's not right in the sight of God. You're in the bond of iniquity, the gall of bitterness. Pray therefore the evil thought of your heart might be forgiven you. And Simon said, pray to the Lord for me that none of the things you have said will happen to me. God was willing to forgive Simon, willing to forgive David, willing to forgive Peter and, and made a plan even when Adam and Eve messed up. And of course, I don't have to look at all those examples to know. In my life and in your life, I know that God's ready to forgive. I know that God's long-suffering. I've made mistakes and you have as well. And God is ready and willing and wants to forgive His children. But friend, please realize this. Forgiveness is not cheap. It comes at a, it came at a very high cost and it ought to make us realize that that sin is not something you want to take for granted or just have fun in and then you can repent of later forgiveness comes at a high cost do we realize that it's forgiveness that caused jesus to leave heaven you know paul says the grace of our lord jesus christ that though he was rich Yet for your sakes he became poor that we, through his poverty, might be made rich. When, when God's son was called out of the ivory palaces and he came to this land of sin and sorrow and, and suffered and died, why did he leave heaven? That's the very place we're trying to go. Why come here and be mocked and laughed at and, and die on a, a cruel cross? That was the cost. That was the price for my sin and for yours. Forgiveness calls Jesus to leave the beauty of heaven. Forgiveness demanded that the sacrifice live a perfect life. Hebrews 4.15 says, He was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf. He committed no sin, nor was guile or deceit found in his mouth. And thus, when John saw Jesus approaching, he could say, Behold, the Lamb of God, that spotless, without blemish, perfect Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Have you ever contemplated what a challenge that must have been? What an ongoing battle every day? Can you imagine not even ever once committing a sin? That's what the sacrifice Forgiveness came at a high cost, and forgiveness demanded that there be a perfect sacrifice. And then, of course, the cost of forgiveness can be so beautifully seen in the horrible suffering that Jesus endured. Jesus said in Matthew 26, 28, This, as he to the Lord's Supper, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. You see, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. When heaven, when, when Jesus echoed those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Can you think about how horrible that must have been to be separated from the Father? To be laughed at and mocked by his own creation? To have them strike Jesus with the palm of their hand? To take that, that crown of thorns and put it on his head and hit him with the reed? 
to bring the cat of nine tails across his back over and over again, to hang in agony and for every breath struggle until Jesus died. Forgiveness came at a high cost. Let's not take that forgiveness for granted. Let's realize what God did for me and you. And then, my friend, let's realize this. For a child of God, if you're not a Christian, of course, to be forgiven, initially, you must obey the gospel of Christ. Peter preached the message about Jesus in Acts chapter 2. They got the point of that. They cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter told them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Acts 2.38, those who gladly received his word, the Bible says were baptized, and the Lord added them that day to his church. Acts 2, verse 42 through 47. And so initially, that's what a person must do to be forgiven of sin. But what about somebody who, after they've been a Christian, messes up? What about the people who, like David or like Peter, do something they shouldn't do? Friend, the Bible teaches to be forgiven of sin, we've got to acknowledge and, and own up to our sin problem. Here's what the Bible says. If we say that we have no sin, we make God a liar and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all iniquity. 1 John 1, verses 6 through 10. The Bible says, confess your trespasses one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. James 5, 16 and 17. You see, when Achan messed up, when he buried that bar of gold and that Babylonian garment under his tent. Achan said, I've sinned. Saul said, I've sinned. I've erred exceedingly. I've played the fool. David said, when Nathan said, you're the man, David said, I've sinned. Judas, he said, I've sinned. I've got to confess. I've got to own up to. I've got to acknowledge that God's divine record is right and that I've messed up and be honest with my sin and my situation. Once I've acknowledged that sin, the Bible teaches I must be willing to repent and to turn from that sin. Luke 13, 3, Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Peter told Simon to repent and pray that the evil thought of your heart might be forgiven you. Repentance is a, a turning from that sin. Acts 3.19, repent and turn that your sins may be blotted out. Acts 17, 30 and 31, truly these times of ignorance God once overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. And so if I'm going to be forgiven, I've got to turn from that sin. I've got to repent of it, change my way of thinking, change my way of acting. And then, of course, like Simon, to be forgiven, one must pray for forgiveness. Acts 8, verse 22, repent and pray that the evil thought of your heart may be forgiven you. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And then Acts 2, 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And so as a child of God, I've got to turn from a life of sin to make sure that I'm right with God, that I'm living like God wants me to. Hey, here's what we've got to do. Friend, I've got to realize I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. I've got, I've, I've got to own up to, I've got to acknowledge that I am a sinner. That, that I have made mistakes. And when something occurs in my life, when I say something or do something or act in some way that a Christian ought not to act, I've got to be humble enough. I've got to be big enough to say, God, I messed up again. That wasn't right. You know it wasn't right. I know it wasn't right. I shouldn't have done it. I'm acknowledging your holiness. I'm trying to attain to that, but I blew it. I messed up. And to be forgiven, I've got to change my way of thinking about whatever action that is. David had to change his way of thinking about the lust of the flesh. Simon had to change his way of thinking about trying to buy the Holy Spirit. Peter had to change his way of thinking about himself and how he really thought he was. 
and whatever sin it is that we struggle with. When we repent, we've got to realize that's not what God wants. That's not how I need to live. I need to turn from that. And then I need to pray. Ask God to forgive me. The Bible tells me God is willing and ready to forgive and that he will indeed forgive that sin. And so as we think today about my sin, man's sin and God's forgiveness, friend, this, we're not meant to discourage. This idea is not meant to, 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 to give us the blues, as it were, but more than anything, to help us realize that if we do make mistakes, and we all do, and if we kind of mess up like sometimes we do, don't throw in the towel. Don't, don't, don't just give up. Don't think it's all over and you may as well go. No. Our God has made a way to be forgiven initially. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, we can be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Galatians 3.27 says, As many of us as were baptized into Christ have clothed ourselves with Christ. And so once you become a Christian, we're not saying everybody who is a Christian is going to live perfect. But when we do make mistakes, we have an avenue. We repent and we pray in God's willing to forgive us. And so, my friend, we ask you today to think about your own life. Where are you at in man's sin and God's forgiveness? Here's where God is. God stands arms ready, willing and open to forgive any who will do what the Bible says. If you've never submitted to Jesus Christ, won't you believe that he's the way, the truth and the life? John 14, 6. Confess that he is the Savior of the world, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Repent of all past sin and turn to God in submission to his will and be baptized for the remission of your sins, Acts 2, 38. And if you're a child of God and you've got something in your life that's not right, repent and pray. Let God help you with that. We're so glad you joined us today and we hope you'll join us next time as we study more from God's Word. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. The gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On demand, and downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.